Okay, so I'm Dr. Molinari. This, our class is anthropology. This is us for the week. Um, so all the students are going to tell, tell what they did, uh, some of their favorite things and what they learned. Um, I just wanna thank you all for letting uh, your children come to this camp this summer. Um, I hope you sign up for more. Um, and thank you to all our sponsors that help fund this week. So here we go. Go ahead. Um, forensic anthropology is the study of human remains, such as analyzing bones. Forensic anthropologists study bones for the purpose of discovering when someone died, how they died, and possibly why they died. They also work to help police figure out how people died. This week, we did gross observations to determine sex, age, ethnicity, and how somebody died. Forensic anthropologists are able to figure out a person's sex and age. This is one of the skeletons we use to do our gross observations. His name is Bobbert. Thank you. Should I go? Do you want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. Sex identification. I'm gonna wrap back over here. Um, forensic anthropologists examine specific bones to determine the victim's sex. With the anatomical differences between men and women, anthropologists are able to analyze the skull, pelvis, femur, and humerus to sex the decomposed body. So here are the pelvis differences between males and females. Males have smaller circular regions in the pelvis, while females have a larger open. <laughs> smaller um, oval-shaped pelvic regions, that way they can carry children. Um, the male pubic arches in the pelvis tend to be more narrow, while the female ones are much wider, again, for childbirth. Um, and the tailbone in males is not flexible. It points inward, and it, it just doesn't move. Females have a very flexible tailbone, and it's straight. It goes straight down. And then for skull differences. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see here, they have a very prominent brow ridge. It like points out it's very obvious. Female skulls do not have it. It's much more obscure. They have square eye orbits, while females have rounder eye orbits. And they have a square jawline, while females have a very pointed jawline, and it's also rounded. They also have a heavier skull, just by, you know, weight. This is much heavier and thicker. Women have a lighter skull. Thank you. Determining the age of a skeleton. We learned that you can closely estimate the age of any given skeleton. The first way you can determine the age is through growth plates. Pre-adolescent deceased have growth plates in their bones that are not fused. By about 20 years of age, the bones have fused together, so they disappear. You can see this picture of the growth plate. Another way you can tell a person's age is through teeth. Teeth tells us the age of a person, especially younger people through observing the types of teeth visible above the gum line and the degree of root development deep within the jawbone. A new technology is observing the tooth enamel. When the person grows, it produces tiny lines. These lines can be counted to get the tooth stage. You can kind of see up here the different months and how old the person is and how the teeth grow. That was our forensic anthropology lesson. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, so we did evolution as our topic, and uh, we did evolution just because we thought it was cool seeing like each step of like how we changed, uh, and then um, like we this week we learned like why we changed and how we changed, and um, we went over early hominids to Neanderthals and how we know we came from them and the main changes of each one. So. Our earliest ancestors originated about 4.4 million years ago with the Ardipithecus ramnidus, and then the Australopithecus uh, afrensis came after that, which is what we know as Lucy. And then a, a couple uh, million years later, um, we went to Homo uh, erotus, um, which coexisted with the Homo habilis, and we also start to see more modern stone tools. 
Um, there are a few things anthropologists use to identify our ancestors, like um, DNA, bipedalism, random skull size, tool use, and the use of language. Um, and Neanderthals around 0.3 to 2% of DNA match um, in modern humans, and uh, nucleotide sequences in Neanderthals and humans are most exactly alike. Um, during the last few million years, the brain size also increased. The size and intricacy change is what led a modern human to have such powerful cognitive abilities. Um, the parent Chiropolis, um, which existed about 2.4 million years ago, had a, um, a crest right here uh, that you can see better on this than in the picture. Um, and it had that because their chewer, chewing muscles were attached to the skull. Um, and over time, the need for large chewing muscles and teeth lessened, so the crest evolved away. Um, and the brain got larger and our teeth progressed to look more human. Um, about 130,000 years ago, um, Neanderthals actually had a bigger head than modern humans do. They have big brow bones and thick skulls. However, they look similar to modern day humans. Um, and the modern human skull still has wisdom teeth, something that hasn't evolved away yet, even though we don't really need them anymore. Um, hello, and we're going to be talking about archaeology. Archaeology has been used to find many different cultures all over the world. Archaeologists have been used different tools such as screens, brushes, and trowels to carefully extract the artifacts they find. Okay, so archaeologists group artifacts called the strata. They were found in strata or the layers of the ground. Archaeologists dig horizontally so they can carefully extract the artifacts they find. We did an activity where we all were given a mock excavation site the same tools that archaeologists would use. In the, mock, in the mock excavation site, we had a pot. We had a pot that was broken into pieces, coins, and animals, which they were supposed to represent bones, and raisins that represented poop. And uh, this is the pot that put it back together. So we did uh, we did genetics, and I decided to tell you a little bit about uh, Mendel's experiment and how it worked. So heterozygous is having dissimilar alleles, alleles of a gene. Homozygous is having alleles of a given gene. A genotype is an or organism's hereditary makeup. And phenotype is an organism's evident bio uh, sorry, biological traits. A Punnett square is used to predict the genotype of breeding, and a Punnett square is used to tell the genotype of offspring. It can be used to predict, for example, an offspring blood type. And the genotypic ratio right here is 0, 2 to 2. And the phenotypic ratio is 2 to 2. Simplify quickly. Chromosomes are the form that our DNA takes to pass from parent to parent, parent to child. Traits. Traits are a genetical disease determined characteristic. Traits are genetically passed down through biological parents. Example, if your parents 
have blue eyes, he will likely have blue or green eyes. His passing down of traits is called heredity. Heredity is just passing down his physical or mental characteristics genetically from one generation to another. Natural selection. Sometimes traits like mutated traits don't last long enough to be passed down. This is called natural selection. Natural selection is the process where organisms better adapted to their environment, survive longer than others. And in this example, flies can sometimes have wrinkled wings. That is a mutated trait passed on from the parent. These flies don't live long enough to reproduce, making it harder for other flies to get this trait. In this example, these beetles are green and the birds like the green beetles, so they all die off in the army once dead.